Hello and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. We're at session six. We're moving on from morphology, the structure of words, to syntax, the structure of phrases and sentences. Uh, today I will be talking about syntactic categories and about constituent structure. Before we do that, let me briefly recapitulate uh, what I talked about last time. There, the topic was morphological productivity and the mental lexicon. So, what's morphological productivity? I said that an affix, like for instance the English nominalizing affix ness, as in greatness, uh, is productive if, uh, first of all, it occurs with many bases, that is, if it has a high type frequency. Second, if, when you're looking at a corpus, you find many so-called hapax legomena, forms that occur only once. And thirdly, if there are few restrictions on new formations. I talked about different types of restrictions there. Pragmatic restrictions, a word has to make sense uh, in order to be used phonological. Some affixes require that the base be of a certain phonological shape. Lexical restrictions, this I talked about in terms of blocking, so the word thief is already there and blocks the potential word stealer. And lastly, semantic restrictions, that a base needs to be of a certain semantic kind to take an affix. So employee is fine, um, screwy is not fine. Okay? <clears throat> right. Um, on towards the mental lexicon. The mental lexicon contains information on a word's sound, meaning, the way it combines with other uh, morphemes, endings, affixes, and the way it combines uh, to phrases and, and sentences. <clears throat> I outline several differences between the mental lexicon, the way words are stored in your brain, and uh, an ordinary dictionary words stored on paper, well, ordinary dictionaries, they have an alphabetical organization, your brain has an associative organization, um, the dictionary stores base forms, you store words redundantly, storing also plural forms, inflected forms, whatnot, and um, <clears throat> the dictionary usually just stores individual words, whereas you also remember word chunks, so several words strung together. Right, uh, an important idea in this regard was the dual route model, which concerns complex words. How do you understand complex words? Well, there are at least uh, two processes at work. They're at work at the same time and they're competing. I talked about these in terms of the whole word route and the decomposition route. If you hear a complex words, uh, a complex word, you process this word simultaneously on both of these routes and the faster one wins the race. So say you hear a word like insane, if that word has a strong representation in its full form, uh, you go through the whole word route, that's very fast. If the word does not have a very strong cognitive representation in your mental lexicon, you look at the parts and uh, figure out the meaning from looking at the parts in and saying, and you figure out, okay, that means not sane. Um, which route wins? Well, um, it turns out that complex words that are more frequent than their component parts, they are processed by the whole word route. An example for this is incomprehensible, which is more frequent than its component part comprehensible. And um, <clears throat> the decomposition route that happens when you have a complex word that is less frequent than its component parts. So illiberal, that's not a very frequent word. Liberal is. So when you hear illiberal, what gets activated is liberal, and then the, the prefix uh, in, okay, gets illiberal. Right, okay, that was it for morphology, really. And uh, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, I uh, suggested a principle that I called the small supermarket principle. If you can buy a compound product in a small supermarket, like toothpaste, then it's likely to be processed by the whole word route, and otherwise 
it's probably going to be the decomposition route. Anchovy paste will decompose that. Very few people have, I think, anchovy paste as one word in their mental lexicon. You have to really like anchovy paste. Right, moving on to syntax. Not everybody's favorite subject. I hope, though, it will become your favorite subject. The main question for the rest of this video is, well, to begin with, what is syntax? Second, what are syntactic categories? You already know syntactic categories. You might not be aware of that, but you do know them. And then, what is syntactic constituency? And to get started, I would like you to pause this video and look at these three sentences here. And uh, I give you a hint. These three sentences, all of them have at least two interpretations. And I'd like you to pause the video and figure out these different interpretations. Okay, pause now. Okay, I'll count to three and then I'll move on. Um, one, two, three, here we go. <clears throat> so, we found a large man's hat in the wardrobe. This can refer to, um, on the one hand, a hat that belongs to a large man, or on the other hand, uh, a man's hat that is large. Yeah. <clears throat> Two cars were reported stolen by the Groveton police yesterday. Could mean that the Groveton police did the reporting, or it could mean that the Groveton police did the stealing. That would be odd, but it's a possible interpretation of the sentence. Then, uh, the mixing bowl is designed to please any cook with a round bottom for efficient beating. Well, is it the bowl that has the round bottom, or is it the cook that has the round bottom that is so efficiently beaten? Yeah. Why am I telling you about um, hats, the police, and, uh, and mixing bowls? Well, the reason is that the different meanings of the sentences reflect differences in syntactic structure and syntactic structures in many uh, linguistics introductions are diagrammed in this way with tree structures okay where the trees reflect syntactic constituents I'll, I'll have something more to say about constituency in just a few minutes so um, compare these two little tree diagrams here a large man's hat and a large man's hat well, they reflect different meanings. In the first uh, tree, the, the left one, we're talking about a man's hat that is large. And uh, in the second example, we're talking about a hat that belongs to a large man. These two different meanings reflected in different syntactic structures. We'll come back to these trees. So, syntax then is uh, first of all, the study of different word classes. Those are syntactic categories like adjectives, nouns, verbs, and so on and so forth. Second, uh, syntax is the study of the combination of words into phrases and sentences. That is the basic definition of syntax that you get most of the time. Um, how do words combine into larger linguistic units? And then syntax also study the internal structure of phrases and sentences, coming at it from the other way, if you like, not from the words, but from the syntactic structures as wholes. Right, <clears throat> let's start with the first point on this list and talk about word classes. Um, in one of the morphology videos, I talked about definitions of words and I said that words are the syntactic building blocks of sentences. So words have a syntactic category, and there are, in fact, structural criteria that allow you to determine what syntactic category a word belongs to. So some word is an adjective if it occur in a certain syntactic context, like, have you seen my thing? Yeah. Um, an adjective could go in there. Have you seen my... Uh, slimy thing. Have you seen my yellow thing? 
Something is a noun if it can occur in the phrase, is this your tie? Is this your key? Is this your canoe? <laughs> right. Um, so, words have classes, and these classes are syntactic categories. Um, there are different types of syntactic categories, um, and people disagree with regard to how many there are of them. However, uh, here are eight of them that I expect you to know and be able to identify. So we will be talking about nouns and verbs and adjectives and adverbs, prepositions, determiners, pronouns, and conjunctions. Here are some examples of these nouns and verbs and adjectives. You know all about that. Adverbs, you do too, uh, quickly, annoyingly, actually. Really, adverbs are a garbage can category. Uh, they tend to pattern very differently syntactically. Prepositions, in, on, under, through, and so on and so forth. Determiners, we're getting to more grammatical. Oh, it's starting to rain. Um, wait a second. Okay, back in my office. Um, yeah, <clears throat> so determiners are forms like un, the, this, uh, my, what, every, and each. <clears throat> uh, this category partly overlaps with pronouns. Uh, so pronouns, things like she, you, who, which, themselves. Um, so what can be both a determiner or a pronoun, depending on how it's uh, integrated into the syntactic context. And then there are conjunctions, things like and, or, because, although. Sometimes these are called uh, connectives, clause connectives. Right. <clears throat> I said that there are structural hints, structural criteria that allow you to identify a word syntactic category. So how do we know that some element actually is a noun? We could take a semantic approach and say, well, a noun is something that denotes something that you can touch. Like, for instance, um, scissors is a noun, glass is a noun, <clears throat> cable is a noun. But more uh, satisfactory, in fact, are structural criteria. So a noun typically takes plural marking. Uh, we can have a cat and we can pluralize that noun, say cats. Um, nouns occur with determiners. We can say the cat, this cat, a cat. Nouns can be modified with an adjective, the fat cat, the black cat. Nouns can be followed by a relative clause, the cat that ran away. And um, <clears throat> Nouns can be suffixed with an affix like less to mean without the noun. So if you're catless, that means that uh, you're deprived of your cat. How do we know that some element is a verb? Well, again, there are structural criteria that work better than just to say that a verb denotes some kind of activity. <clears throat> so a verb typically takes tense marking, like the past in washed. A uh, verb can occur with an auxiliary verb, so you could wash the dishes. Uh, a verb can be modified with an adverb. You can wash quickly. Um, you can suffix a verb with able to mean something can be verbed. So if your shirt is washable, then uh, you, can, you can put it in the washer. How do we know that some element is an adjective? Also here there are structural criteria. An adjective typically takes uh, morphological marking of the comparative and superlative. So somebody is smart, but the next person is smarter, and the third person is smartest of them all. Uh, adjectives can be taken to modify nouns, so we can have smart students. Um, adjective can be modified with an adverb, so somebody can be extremely smart, and adjectives can be suffixed with 
li to mean in an adjective kind of way. Um, so you can respond smartly. Moving on to the class of determiners, uh, how do we know that some element is a determiner? <clears throat> determiners precede nouns. Uh, so we have an aardvark, my grandmother. Um, determiners precede a modified noun, uh, my old grandmother. Determiners cannot precede another determiner, my, the aardvark. Doesn't work. One determiner, that's all you get. And uh, determiners do not inflect. Um, they don't take any morphology whatsoever. Not inflectional morphology, not derivational morphology. So you cannot form words like eacher or talk about the thatness of something. Yeah. Right. Um, moving on from syntactic categories, word classes to constituency, syntactic constituency. Um, <clears throat> Constituents are the parts of a sentence. So some sequences of words in a sentence belong together more closely than other sequences of words. And depending on where you draw the boundaries between different constituents, you get these different meanings uh, in sentences like, you know, the, the Groveton police and uh, the larger man's hat. Here's another example. Old men and women like sports cars. What does that mean? It does have two possible interpretations. Uh, first of all, you might take it to mean that you have men and women, both old, that like sports cars. Or it could be that uh, old men like sports cars and women also like sports cars. The difference between these two interpretations is one of syntactic constituency, which sequences of words belong together. On the first interpretation, men and women form a constituent. On the second interpretation, men and women do not form a constituent. Okay, <clears throat> so I said the parts of a sentence are called constituents. You can break down a sentence into its constituents. And um, this structure the constituent structure of a sentence is hierarchical. Um, so the hierarchical structure of a sentence is called syntactic constituency. Now there are syntactic rules that specify how constituents can be put together to form grammatical sentences and speakers are aware of these rules. They aren't necessarily consciously aware of these. So. <clears throat> I mentioned the example of a young child being able to form relative clauses, but nobody knows what a relative clause really is. So speakers unconsciously know these syntactic rules. Now, <clears throat> um, it's uncontroversial that speakers have this knowledge of how some sequences of words are possible, whereas others are not possible. And here I've given you some made up examples from words uh, from the Jabberwocky poem. Um, so those are nonce words, not real English words. Uh, the slithy toves gimbled in the wabe. That is a strange sentence, but one that seems grammatically okay. That's a little funny, but you know, that's what it is. The slithy toves, they gimbled in the wabe uh, for a while. Note that this sentence is more acceptable and a lot more acceptable than the slithy toves gimbled in wave the. That doesn't make any sense. Also, the slithy toves the wave gimbled in. Nah, nah, that doesn't sound right. And lastly, the toves slithy gimbled in the wave. Nah, that, that's not right. That's not right. So, how do speakers know that the first one is okay? and the three other ones are bad, not real English. Yeah, the first one, funny words, but real English. The other three ones, word soup. No real English, nothing. 
Um, so if a sentence is perceived as ungrammatical, that means that speakers have no syntactic rule that would allow them to put it together in this way. <clears throat> Let's talk about a simple syntactic rule. A sentence can be formed through a combination of two phrases, two major phrase types, namely a noun phrase and a verb phrase. So you write this as S, that's a sentence, you get a sentence by combining a noun phrase, an NP, plus a VP, a verb phrase. Okay, And anything that's a noun phrase and anything that's a verb phrase, you can combine in this way. So you get sentences like John dances, Bob likes ice cream, the spy with the binoculars fell off his bicycle. And note that you can interchange um, these NPs and, and VPs with one another. You could say the spy with the binoculars likes ice cream or Bob dances. Moving on to more complex syntactic rules. Let's think about how in English we can form a question. Let's say we have a sentence that is comprised of five words. John will be here soon. And we want to transform this sentence into a question. Will John be here soon? Um, it seems that what the syntactic rule here does um, by transforming a declarative clause into a question is that it exchanges the first two words. Yeah, uh, from John will be here soon, we get will John be here soon. However, um, this does not seem to work in all cases. If we have a sentence like the ambulance will be here soon, uh, we can form a question by saying ambulance the will be here soon. Uh, word counting does not work. Syntax does not count words. Instead, what it does operate on are uh, constituents. Syntactic rules operate on constituents. If we look at the constituents of this sentence, the ambulance will be here soon, uh, we notice that first we have an NP, the ambulance, yeah, that's a noun phrase, then we have an auxiliary verb, will, and we, we have a verb phrase, be here soon. And uh, what you have to do in order to get a question from this declarative sentence is uh, you have to exchange the order of NP and auxiliary. Okay, this is known in the literature as subject auxiliary inversion. It's kind of famous. Yeah. Right, so from the ambulance will be here soon, you get will the ambulance be here soon. Now, <clears throat> uh, you know what syntactic categories are, you know what constituency is as such, but I haven't told you just yet just how you can tell whether a group of words belongs together, whether a group of words forms a constituent, and that's accomplished by a few constituency tests, so-called constituency tests. Uh, which probe whether a string of words behaves as a unit, as a constituent. Right. Um, consider this sentence here at the bottom of the slide. A friendly cop drove the kids across town. How can this sentence be divided into parts and how can we show that these parts belong together? One important constituency test is the so-called substitution test where you substitute uh, constituents, strings of words, by a single word, typically a pronoun, a form of do, or an adverb like here or there. So if you apply the substitution test to the sentence, uh, a friendly cop drove the kids across town, you could, for instance, take this string of words, a friendly cop, and replace it uh, with a pronoun like he. You also could take <clears throat> uh, the phrase uh, the kids and replace that with them. Okay, He drove them across town. <clears throat> 
If you take uh, the phrase across town, you could say um, he drove them there. Um, <clears throat> moving on to more complex structures, um, well, drove the kids across town, that is a verb phrase, and you can um, show that it in fact is a phrase by replacing the whole thing with just a form of the verb do, a friendly cop did. Yeah, who drove the kids across town? A friendly cop did. Okay, um, the second constituency test that I want to present is called the question test. And uh, the way it works is you have to ask yourself, can you replace um, the phrase with a question word and then answer the question with the exact phrase that you, you wanted to uh, ask for. Taking again the sentence, a friendly cop drove the kids across town. Um, who drove the kids across town? A friendly cop. Um, a friendly cop drove whom across town? Well, the kids. Who did the friendly cop drive across town? The kids. Um, across town? Uh, where did the friendly cop drive the kids? Across town. Moving on to the verb phrase. Um, <clears throat> what did the friendly cop do? He drove the kids across town. So that doesn't quite work in the same way. Yeah, what did the friendly cop do? Drive the kids across town is something you might say, or he drove the kids across town. Drove the kids across town doesn't work quite that well. So keep in mind that these constituency tests may not always yield the result that you have in mind. Okay, let's apply these tests and uh, see what types of constituents there are in the sentence. The way you do it is to start with the word classes. Okay, If you're given a sentence for a syntactic analysis, the first thing you do is label each word with its syntactic category with its word class. So, a, uh, that's a determiner, friendly, that's an adjective, cop, that's a noun, drove, that's a verb, the, another determiner, kids, another noun, across, that's a preposition, and town, that's a noun. <clears throat> a friendly cop, that is a noun phrase, and we've established by the constituency tests that, okay, this is a phrase. The kids, that's another noun phrase, as established by our constituency tests. Across town, that is a prepositional phrase. Drive the kids across town um, by the substitution test is a verb phrase. And I've told you that constituents are nested within one another. The syntactic structure of a sentence is hierarchically organized. So one phrase may be a part of a larger phrase. In this case, the kids and across town are both part of the verb phrase drove the kids across town. And of course, the noun phrase and the verb phrase together form a sentence. So, uh, syntax then is not flat. It's not uh, as diagrammed in this tree that you have a sentence and then the sentence branches out in all the different words that it uh, comprises. Rather, syntactic structure is branching. So a sentence branches out in a noun phrase and a verb phrase and the noun phrase branches out in different words and the verb phrase branches out into different phrases, into different words. Right. <clears throat> this brings us to a tree diagram for a friendly cop drove the kids across town. How do you go about drawing tree diagrams? Well, again, you start with the sentence at the bottom of the page, preferably. Then you add 
the word category labels, determiner, adjective, noun, and so on and so forth. And then you start drawing the tree from the bottom up. Okay? So you identify phrases uh, from these labels. For instance, you identify a friendly cop as a noun phrase through the substitution test or through the questioning test and establish that, okay, this is an NP. Then you find another small NP here. You find a prepositional phrase here and um, you work your way up from there. So how do you connect the rest of the dots, really? Um, well, do the kids across town, is that a constituent? Can you replace that? Can you ask for it? It seems that um, you can't really replace the kids across town with a single word. That doesn't work. Um, so it seems that um, you have a verb phrase that combines drove the, the kids NP and across town prepositional phrase in one phrase. And once you're at the stage of having an NP and a VP, then your job really is done. You connect the two to form a sentence. And that's when you're, well, when your job is done. Right. Uh, I have one more slide. I'm curious what's on there. All right. Quick summary of syntactic analysis. Always start with the word classes at the bottom. Always have sentence at the top, branching into noun phrase and verb phrase. One important thing that I haven't said yet, lines are not allowed to cross. Um, we'll have to find a solution where the lines don't cross. And Another important point is that each label, uh, each node in the diagram, that is where, where two lines join, you should have a label for it, okay? So don't just connect lines and not have a label. Uh, each node needs to instantiate a certain phrase. All right, we'll practice this uh, in class and I hope you come with questions. And I uh, look forward to seeing you next week.